Good morning and welcome to Dorset Council's Licensing Committee and welcome to you. My name is Councillor Emma Parker and I'm Chairman of Dorset Council's Licensing Committee and I have with me today as well my Vice, Council, my Vice Chairman, Councillor John Andrews. Um, at the moment, virtual committee meetings are continuing and for today's licensing meeting where a decision is required, the appropriate officer will make the, that decision after taking into account the express view, the views expressed by the wider uh, licensing committee members. Is that OK? Thank you. I'm going to do a roll call because obviously um, we've got um, a two minded two decisions to make today. So I want to make sure that we've got everybody um, on here and we've got apologies for everybody who should have. So I will go down through um, my list. Obviously, I've got Councillor John Andrews. I'm present. Thank you. Councillor Mike Barron. No. Councillor Derek Beer. Present. Thank you. Um, I believe I've got apologies from Councillor Susan Cocking. Um, Councillor Mike Dyer. Present, Chair. Thank you. Got an apology from Les Fry. Have I got Councillor Paul Harrison? Councillor Brian Heatley. I'm here, Chair. Councillor Carol Jones. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cathy Lugg. OK, uh, I've got apologies from David Morgan. Councillor Julie Robinson. Councillor David Taylor. Uh, present Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Kate Weller. No, OK, I'll just now go down through my list of uh, officers in attendance. Do I have our licensing team leader, Aileen? Yes, Chair, you do. I'm here. Thank you. And do we have our service manager for licensing and community safety operations? And that's John Newcomb. Good morning, Chair. Yes, present. Thank you. And uh, housing standards service manager, um, Richard Conway. Yes, Chair, I'm present. Thank you. And then Corporate Director of uh, for Housing, Andrew Billany. Um, yes, I'm present. Thank you. And then Head of Community and Public Protection of Ivor Graham Duggan. Uh, present, Chair. Thank you very much. And I have uh, Elaine. Yes, I'm here, Chair. Thank you. Uh, we've got Lara, our legal rep. Good morning, Chair. I'm here. Thank you. And I've obviously got our meeting producers and that's uh, Judy Saunders and Lee Johnson. Good morning, Chair. Thank you. Um, I've just moved on. Um, Elaine, can you just confirm what apologies we have for today? Yes, I've got three apologies from councillors Susan Cocking, David Morgan and Les Fry. OK, thank you. What I do is I'll go through the, the list and if the others join us through the meeting, then obviously that's uh, that's fine. Thank you. Um, do we uh, councillors, does anybody got any declarations of interest? Chair, yeah, uh, I have to declare an interest on uh, uh, agenda item four. I will not be taking part in any discussions or voting on anything. OK, thank you, Councillor Andrews. Do we have any declarations of interest from anybody else? No. OK, thank you. Uh, do we have any um, public participation? No, we don't. No. OK, thank you. Um, so I will now move on then to um, agenda item four, which is for the park home fees. And I will uh, get Richard Conway to introduce the uh, report, please. Uh, yes, good morning, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'll just um, give a brief um, introduction to the report and um, then take any questions afterwards. Um, the Mobile Homes Act 2013 allows councils to charge for a range of licensing activities on park home sites in Dorset. In order to do this, the council must agree a policy describing how we will do it. When Dorset Council was formed, three former district and borough policies novated to Dorset Council 
differed in the way that fees were calculated. This new policy before you today replaces them and introduces one method for calculating fees that standardizes what sites will pay for the licensing services that we provide. In addition, earlier this year, the government introduced new regulations for the operators of sites. So operators must now apply to be accepted on a fit and, per, fit and proper person register. So the rules related to those applications are also included in this policy. So in summary, the new policy before you sets fees for the following activities. Fees for new sites, annual fees for existing sites, amendments to licenses, both minor and major, the lodging of park rules, and those applications for the fit and proper person register. In addition, in addition, uh, Madam Chairman, the legislation states that we need to set out how we calculate our fees and details of this are also set out in the appendix of the policy document. So there are two recommendations, Madam Chairman, to this report. The first is that the licensing committee consider the policy and if, and if minded to recommend to cabinet uh, the approval of the policy attached in appendix one to this report. The second recommendation is that licensing committee recommends that cabinet delegate to the corporate director of housing and community services in consultation with the portfolio holder for customer and community services authority to take to make minor changes to the policy to comply with changes in legislation or to reflect increases or decreases in the cost of administering the functions described in the policy. I'll be happy to take um, any questions about the report. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you for um, a, a, a really good report as well. Uh, councillors, do you have any questions? I have got them um, with me because I can't see my chat bar. Um, I'm asking a question. Yeah, we've got uh, Councillor David Taylor and Carol Jones have both um, put, in, put in a request this week. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you please explain to me uh, what fit and proper person means? Or is this another way of a DBS check? I, I don't quite understand the language of it. OK, so um, I, I won't go into the full details, but the regulations set out a range of um, um, issues that the operators of sites need to tell us about. One of those is a, um, a DBS check and um, so operators do need to provide us with a with a current DBS check, but we also take into account things like um, uh, uh, past um, uh, formal actions that may have been taken on sites um, and those would include, for example, a planning breach or a um, or a prosecution, for example, against um, a um, an enforcement notice. So all, all those need to be taken into account in a um, in a in a in the fit and proper person application. Um, once um, a, an operator passes that, then they would be added to the register. If we refuse that, then um, there is an appeal process. So currently applications for those um, sites, for our sites, are, are, are currently um, in the, in the um, are being um, uh, uh, considered by uh, my team at the, at the present time. Okay. Does that mean to say that this is generally a protection for, for us as council to make sure that we don't have any problems with people that have, uh, shall we say, ill repute? Um, it's was, it was more protection for the residents living on site so that uh, for exactly that reason. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. I just think it should be explained a bit clearer because it's not clear in the caption what exactly is going on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you. Um, one's a really stupid question, but I don't actually understand what you mean by deposit of site rules. I, I'm just not, where do they go? And I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. But on to the um, hourly charges, I just think they're too low. And I don't know whether this is something you have to do by actual cost, because I mean, realistically, you've got um, an hourly rate of just 22, 24 for a support officer. I mean, it, 
if you had a gardener or a decorator, you're going to be paying, you know, so much more. And I think we're sort of rather underselling our actual costs because it's not just the cost of somebody's pay, it's the premises, it's the overheads and so on and so forth. And where you've actually got under um, in the uh, amendment, if they're doing amendments, you're, you're charging by say 25 minutes. But I, I think, is there not a way we can say, look, there is a minimum hourly charge and, and we don't charge by the minute, we charge by the hour. Or are we going against everything we're allowed to do as a council? Because I, I just think that's too cheap. And I just wonder if it can be reviewed or looked at. Um, OK, they're all good points. Um, I'll take them. I'll take them one by one. The government have um, issued specific guidance for how we calculate the fees. And um, so things like the um, um, the overheads of the building we specifically we're unable to charge for. So the, the, the guidance is quite specific about how we can do that. So we are we're a little bit um, stymied by that um, that guidance. Um, I would say, though, that guidance also requires us to review the um, the fees on a three yearly basis. So um, the the starting point was the 1st of April 2019 when Dorset Council was formed. So we will review those fees in a year's time when we're when the council is three years old and, uh, and come back on that very issue. Um, the question, the first question you had about deposit of site rules. Yeah, um, th that's that's again is a term that's used in the um, in the legislation. Basically, what it means is that sites um, have park rules, which are nothing to do with the council. We don't we don't um, 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 adjudicate on those rules, but the legislation um, requires us to um, when site rules have been adopted by a site, we have to accept them. And and then we basically when the word deposit means we've accepted accepted them and then we we can provide them to anyone that wishes to have them. So we have a list on our uh, website with um, the, the, the sites that have got park rules adopted and it's effectively it's an administrative process where we take a set of rules and and store them and provide them if people need them. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, will the charges come back to this committee uh, for next year and will we be able to look at having a minimum so we don't charge by the minute, it's the minimum will be the first hour at all. Will, will that come back here? Uh, I would assume, I would assume um, Madam Chairman, that it probably would do, yes. So we, it would be a, a report to, um, to licensing committee. Lovely, thank you very much. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Jones. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Heatley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm I can't work out from this paper what is going on at the moment. Is this replacing a whole lot of different fees set by the predecessor councils? And and if so, uh, how different are these fees from those predecessor councils? And are there going to be places where, um, how shall I put it, there are substantial increases because people maybe haven't been keeping their fees quite up with where they ought to be? OK, another good question. So, uh, yes, this this policy will replace the the old policies um, and those uh, that the, these fees will come into force when um, we, uh, if adopted um, from from this point onwards. So annual fees, for example, will be will be paid will we'll start for this policy will start to be paid next year. So we're currently still operating under the old policies. Now, the reason why there is discrepancies in the way that cap fees were calculated goes back to the government guidance, which was issued back in 2014. The government guidance gave councils a, um, three different methods for calculating fees. So um, in this policy, we're using a banding method for um, annual fees, for example. And um, whereas in, in there are two other different methods for calculating those fees. One, one for example, is based on the, the exact number of homes on a site. So those three policies and, and the particular um, difference is in the way that annual fees are calculated. And those are the fees that get passed on to residents. So they're the ones that are of, of interest to residents. Um, those three policies all calculated that fee differently. So um, in, in some areas of Dorset, the, um, the fee for a larger site will vary um, between two or three hundred pounds currently. This policy will bring that together. Overall, there's the council will be bringing in no further charges. The, the overall, the actual take of, um, of money doesn't increase. 
does that does that explain it for you? I kind of clarify that. Yes, there, but um, uh, are there areas of Dorset where systematically the fees will be substantially greater, and which um, we may begin to hear about as ward members? <laughs> Yes, certainly. Um, um, the, the fees are likely in some areas will go up by um, a, an amount of a, of a couple of hundred pounds. So site owners pay that. When, when that is um, passed on to residents, that gets divided by the number of homes on a site. So on a large site, for example, um, where there may be three, um, uh, uh, say, 100 um, homes, the, um, if you divide that by um, a few hundred pounds increase of that license, the actual amount annually is 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 still very small. It's below um, below ten pounds per resident. So the actual impact on residents is very small. But you you probably still will find some residents um, contacting you about it. But the actual impact overall is is minor compared to the the wider picture. Um, residents will pe be paying hundreds of pounds for their pitch fee. And, and is it possible for you to say uh, what areas where we are likely to have this this sort of change? I, I can do. I think it's possibly best if I do that out of um, out of the meeting. I can give you that information um, and, and just let okay. you know what what the, dis the the former districts are currently charging. OK, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Heatley. Do we have any other questions? I've got nobody else with their hand up. Um, mine's more of a, a, a comment and then um, a, a question. I'm really pleased to see the uh, fit and proper person register um, within this policy. Um, it's it's something really good, um, as uh, I'm, I'm sure most of uh, councillors that do have uh, sites within their wards um, have uh, either got ones that run really well or don't run quite so well so this this uh, fit and proper person I'm really really pleased to see in that and um, Andrew can I ask obviously the I believe the closing date for the registration for that was in September uh, so yeah Richard sorry uh, so yes Richard, it is sorry <laughs> and, um, we've, and so, yes, it was. And so um, do we have outstanding um, people that need to go on that register Yes, we're currently we've received in the order of about 50 applications. We've got about um, the, the the number of sites does change as, as sites become move and, and some become caravan sites, for example. But we've got about 45 sites with about 50 odd applications. So some some sites have more than one person applying to be added to the register. We've, we've currently received those applications and we're now starting the process of, um, um, of administering them basically and going through the information um, submitted. As that happens, we will add people to a register and that register will be published online on the council's website. OK, um, and if you've got anybody sort of outstanding from that register that you know of that doesn't sort of uh, put their register, you know, their registration in, in, in sort of good time, what, what happens to that? What happens then? Is, is there a period of when, you know, do, do they then have to sort of, you know, do their license get suspended for a certain amount of time until they until they've complied? Well, there's uh, there, there could be some reasons why um, those applications are delayed. So, for example, if a site's being sold at the moment, there may be some um, delay. And we know of one site where the um, the uh, the a company owning multiple sites across England, um, the person required to do the applications left um, uh, three weeks before the deadline, and and so they they were delays. So we do know that there are reasonable reasons for some delays. Um, if there is um, no application or an invalid application or or someone um, um, specifically um, doesn't apply, then we ha we have recourse to um, take legal action. OK, thank you. Thank you. Like I said, really, really good report and um, really pleased to, uh, to to see that in there. So, uh, so so thank you for your work on that. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, do we have any further questions before we go to the recommendation? OK. Um, Richard, just for, um, oh, bear with me, I've got a right to speak from David Taylor. Councillor Taylor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Richard. I'm, I really am struggling with this because of the fact of the Enforcement Act of it. As Emma's, uh, sorry, as the Chair's just uh, stipulated, September 2021 20, was the cutoff date, but we've got no Enforcement Action regarding the paperwork to actually include what's going on now. So what is actually happening there? 
Okay, and for um, again, another good question. Um, enforcement activity generally um, is not is specifically not in this policy. So um, that the, the regulations uh, for the fit and proper person brought in specific powers for um, um, local authorities, but this policy is not about enforcement. This is about the fees. So that's why it's not in there. Do we have a, pol a separate policy ready for this? Um, that the, the housing standards has a has an enforcement policy um, in terms of the fit and proper person um, regulations. It, it, we would use those basic principles of um, of how we would enforce. We're, we're not at that position at the moment. We, we've actually just got the applications in, so it, it will take us some time to actually get through the applications prior to getting into any enforcement. I, I'm not aware that we're looking at enforcement in any cases at the moment. So you can understand my concern. Can we actually do it? That's the question. Yeah, I do understand your concern. Um, I, I, as I say, we, we're not we're not expecting to do it to take any enforcement action at the moment, but that may may occur in the future. But um, um, my my service to, has a, a um, an enforcement policy with general principles in it about how we take enforcement action. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's a concern, but I th I think you understand. I take yeah. that on board. Yeah. 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 I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that any um, enforcement would be very, very minimal. I think uh, anybody that's um, ha has got the park home would uh, find that it's quite a, a straightforward process and something that they would be happy to be to be part of. So hopefully we we, we won't need to go down that route. But no, but no. But again, thank you. Um, appreciate that. Um, Richard, just for clarification with the recommendations that we've got here, I believe that we are looking at it as two, um, two re recommendations, as in are we either or, either it goes to Cabinet for approval or we put it forward for Cabinet to delegate authority, or does it, is it going to go to Cabinet first and then Cabinet will take that decision to delegate the authority? Oh, in terms of the um, recommendation, mm, recommendation yeah. two, um, they're both recommendations to cabinet to approve um, those recommendations. Yes. OK, and and it's for us to to a, a, approve uh, if, if yep. we feel to to a, to, mind to. to approve them both as well. So yep. it'd be it'd be both. So I'm happy to take them um, both on 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 one. Um, obviously, as it, it makes sense to. Um, so I will go down through the list if you're happy. And then if you can say that you are uh, either happy to or if you're minded um to approve or if you are minded to um refuse or minded to abstain um Jim, i will Jim, start could we have the proposing seconder or yes of please. course we can thank you so if i could have a proposer please on these uh, recommendations i'm happy to propose chair councillor carol jones thank you and i've got a seconder yeah derek beer thank you derek OK, I will um, go down through our list and um, do we have Councillor Barron here? No, OK, I will start with Councillor Beer. In favour, minded to, thank you. Thank you, I'm minded to approve, yeah? Yes, indeed, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got Councillor Mike Dyer. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you very much. And did we have Councillor Paul Harrison? No. OK, Councillor Brian Heatley. Approved, Chair. Councillor Jones. Minded to approve, Chair. Thank you. Uh, did we have uh, Councillor Cathy Lug? No, OK. Uh, Councillor Judy Robinson. No. Councillor David Taylor. Mine's to prove, but I wish the language was a little bit clearer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I have Councillor Kate Weller. Approve. Thank you. OK, thank you. And uh, I am also minded uh, to approve as well. So thank you ever so much for that. Um, and we I believe that we do have uh, Andrew here who is going to take our minded to decisions. Do we have Andrew here? 
Apologies. Uh, yes, That's I'm okay. <laughs> just happy to take that. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for um, uh, a good report there, Richard. Really appreciate it and appreciate your time. Could OK, I, thank you, Chair. And I had a point, Chair, just around the, on the uh, delegated authority. I think we, uh, Councillor Taylor's point about the impact of enforcement. I, I, I just reinforce Richard's point of if we have additional uh, resources required, we, we'll, we'll cover that under the delegated authority. Because yeah. clearly we uh, we're just getting through this stage first, but they I, I'm taking the gist of the question was around how do we how do we deal with the actual enforcement once that comes up comes on. So we'll re review that as we as we progress. Yeah, that is fantastic news because I was very concerned that they could just slip under the net. And yeah. with the language in the report, it's there are problems. I thought, OK, but thank you. Anna. It was a great, thank you. I, I understand the point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, officers. Appreciate that. OK, um, I will now move on to the next agenda item, which is agenda item five, and that is for our taxi licensing policy. Uh, welcome back, Councillor Andrews. Um, so I will now uh, get uh, John Newcomb, who is the service manager for licensing and community safety operations to introduce for us. John. Good morning, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, yes, this is um, a, a report relating to a new taxi policy, which has been out for consultation. So today the proposal is that we uh, run through the responses. We consider the comments from Place and Resources Overview Committee, um, discuss the key issues that have been raised during the consultation, and then um, hopefully approve the draft taxi policy for adoption and agree the implementation date. Um, so prior to this um, uh, a new policy being drafted, we have four uh, predecessor council policies. Um, we started work on this uh, quite a long time ago. We set up some focus groups, had a look at our existing policies, looked at um, best practice around the country, um, uh, looked at all of the guidance, statutory guidance, legislation, etc. Um, pulled together our draft policy um, and that has been out for consultation for 12 weeks, which started on the 28th of June and closed on the 19th of September. Um, we, we, we had quite a good response, Chair. I was quite pleased, actually. We had 64 responses and then we had some additional comments from uh, Place and Resources Overview. And um, one of those uh, uh, other responses was from Dorset Disability Equality Forum, which um, which is, has been really helpful, actually it's helped a great deal with our equality charter. So all of the appendices are there in the report. So there, there's a summary report of the consultations received. There's, there's an appendix attached to that, which has got all of the actual responses. Um, we've got the place and resources minutes from that meeting. Our draft policy, which I'm going to run through in a moment. Um, uh, we we haven't um, changed the equalities impact assessment uh, substantially. And then um, there's there's also a couple of extra appendices, one relating to the council's advertising standards and also the response from the disability forum. Uh, quite a lot of background papers as well, some of it quite dry reading chair. So <laughs> apologies if you if you got uh, got stuck in those. They, they, they do date back quite a long time taxi legislation, both of them. Um, yes, yeah, so 64 responses, Re really pleased, really pleased that um, the trade got involved. Um, big, big thank you to them for um, letting us know their thoughts. Um, obviously, this is their livelihood. This, these are their businesses. Um, and we, contrary to popular belief, we do care about our license holders and we do, we do care about the taxi trade. It's incredibly important for our um, residents and our business owners and so we we try we try to help them with working within the confines of the legislation and the guidance but also to to keep the traveling public safe which is of course the overriding um, requirement of a, of a taxi licensing policy so yes yeah, so consultation responses uh, appendix a and b and then um, the equality um, response at Appendix D. So Chair, if it's all right with you, if I, um, if you're happy with me just to share my screen, yes. I'll run through, I'll nice. run through yeah. the changes which, um, which we've 
um, proposed. Now, I'm starting on page 105 of the agenda for those who want, want to follow old school, but um, hopefully you can see that on the screen anyway. Is that come up all right? Yeah. OK, fantastic. So the first change um, relates to section one um, at um, paragraph 1.3. So we, we've, we need a bit of time to bring this policy in. So obviously it's taken quite a while to get the draft prepared and put it out to consultation. But we, we also have quite a lot of work to do behind the scenes. We, we've got um, uh, a, a whole raft of garages that we need to get approved across the whole of the Dorset Council area. We need to set up our training courses. We've got um, we've got um, a, a quite a lot of work to do on fees and charges and also on setting maximum tariffs. So we're proposing that we have a, a implementation date of the 1st of April 2022. So that's kind of the first decision to be made. But um, as a caveat to that, Chair, in, in relation to safeguarding and public safety. We'd like to bring the criminal conviction element of the policy in um, as soon as possible. Now, in, in the draft policy, it says with immediate effect. Now, we've had a chat with the legal team, uh, with Lara. Um, what, what we're proposing, Chair, is to slightly tweak that and to, to bring that criminal conviction element in from the 1st of December, if that's OK. And I will update the policy to that effect if the committee are minded to agree that. Um, I don't know how you want to tackle this. Do you want to tackle each each amendment, each as a discussion point and agreement, or or should we wrap it all up at I, the end? I, I I really don't mind on whatever's what, whatever works better for you. Um, I don't know if you want to go through it and then um, if people want to note questions down, ask ask questions afterwards. It's entirely up to you. Okay. The floor okay, is yours. Fantastic. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. So uh, I think what I what I'll do is I'll, I'll put forward the proposals. Is, and if anybody's got any objections, then please by all means um, um, jump in, and, and we'll we'll do it real time. That that probably works better. So so that's the that's the first sort of um, decision. So policy take effect from first of April next year. Uh, criminal conviction element of the policy appendix G to come in um, from if first of December this year. Um, then if I, I move on to our, our next amendment, so I'm going to go a little bit slower um, so as not to make you feel seasick. So so the, the next amendments have come via comments received during consultation. We, we've just tweaked the wording um, on safeguarding. You can see the changes there in paragraph 2.4. Um, we've also added in an extra uh, paragraph relating to domestic abuse, which um, was gratefully received from uh, um, Councillor Lead on domestic abuse, Councillor Rennie, um, and that, uh, that paragraph has been added in in consultation with the community safety uh, strategic side of the council. Um, the next change is down at 2.8 where what we've what we've done chair because we've we've made some quite significant amendments to the equality charter and we still we are still committed to that charter um we, we've just tweaked the wording slightly so we will be looking to actively promote the equality charter and that and that may involve enforcement and that may involve bringing uh, license holders uh, before committee for, for significant breaches. But um, we thought that the robustly enforcing was, was a little bit too strong, especially for a new for a new addition to to a policy. Um, so we'll keep that under review and you'll you're more than likely hear if um, there are any issues. So that equality charter, which is a Appendix G, I'll cover that a, a little bit later on, Chair, when I get to that section, if that's OK. So the rest of the comments relating to the equality section here in the policy, um, they, they, they were primarily concerned with the with the additional training courses. Now, this is a key aspect of the policy for us, that, we're, that we do invest in our drivers and we do um, give them additional training over and above the mandatory safeguarding training course. Now, we, we don't feel it's appropriate to load that course up with all of the additional modules because there will be quite a few of those. It's still a work in progress, but they, they won't be mandatory. They, they will be voluntary. They will be a cost recovery basis, so we will not be looking to make profit from running those courses and they will um, obviously give uh, an advantage potentially to those license holders who have completed those courses and uh, wish to advertise that to the traveling public. 
Um, so I will move down to suitable. Vi oh, sorry. So another little change there in paragraph 2.15, just um, just a, a, an error in our original draft, which has been corrected. Sorry, this is uh, this is as fast as my mouse moves. <laughs> Apologies. So the, ne the next tweet, Chair, is at um, paragraph 2.39. Now this is um, this is in relation to vehicle inspections. Now now we're we're relying heavily on vehicle inspections to keep the fleet safe, to keep the keep the public safe. Now we don't feel it's appropriate to put in uh, mandatory age limits or arbitrary mileage limits. We think that there are some uh, very roadworthy and um, high class vehicles out there that are quite old, certainly used for weddings and functions, etc. But also that um, taxis uh, can potentially run for large mileages, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be right to impose a limit um, in, in those respects. So what, what we're doing is we're relying on inspections, six monthly inspections, regardless of age or mileage. And what we have taken on board, though, is a comment that's come in from the trade that that um, it, it's a bit onerous to inspect brand new vehicles. And we agree. We, we, so we've amended the policy. Um, so no brand new vehicle, licensed vehicle will be required to be inspected f under the taxi inspection regime until it uh, reaches the age of 12 months. So it's a, a, a tweak to the policy there, Chair. The next amendment is at paragraph 2.42, and that's just really uh, a response to a consultation uh, comment which came in just um, concerned about the level of information that we would be sharing. So we've clarified what sort of information we'll be sharing, um, and it, it, it relates to crime prevention and complaints and Dorset Council contracts, etc. Let me just uh, scroll down on my notes, Chair. Bear with me, please. OK, so uh, some. Changes to the wording again in relation to safeguarding just uh, there on page 117 of your agendas, uh, no, nothing too radical. And I think the next amendment doesn't come for a little while unless I've missed zones. Should have maybe put the page numbers on here. My apologies, Chair. What, what I'm going to do, Chair, I'm just going to pop over to, to my notes. So, um, there we are. Thank you, Chair. OK, so um, I just. We have it. We, we have a, um, a number of responses in relation to the zones, Chair, which um, we've put three proposals in the report for you to consider today. The, the, the first proposal is that we retain all of the existing council predecessor a predecessor council zones. Now that would be quite onerous for us as a licensing team. We'd have to issue five different sets of license. Um, it, it could get uh, potentially problematic and it would be quite difficult to enforce and to police. Um, the second choice would be to uh, remove all of the um, zones and create one big zone and that would be potentially problematic for those uh, proprietors in um, Weymouth where there is currently a limit on the number of hackney carriage vehicles um, and they have just very recently paid for an unmet demand survey which uh, helps to justify retention of that limit and if we were going to deregulate chairman then uh, potentially that that money would need to be refunded and um, there could be a loss of earnings for drivers in relation to the value of their plates so a uh, recommendation to the committee is that we stick with um, with the uh, existing proposal which is in the policy that, that we have one big zone for the whole of Dorset, but in Weymouth, the hackney carriages are regulated and limited um, a, as per the current arrangements. Now, I'm happy to pause at this point and, and uh, have a discussion about that if, if you wish to or any of the other committee members. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to say if there's anybody else uh, on here that um, has uh, a question um, re regarding those uh, those those three. Um, those three options. Um, I do 
have um, I've got I've got Councillor David Taylor, but I didn't know if that was around this the, around the zoning. Oh. Is that OK, Speaker? Is it around the zones? Yeah, it's about the zones, but it's also about the incredible amount of work that uh, John has done on this, because I seem to remember in the very beginning of all of this about two years ago. Just one question. Yeah, sorry. The question, no, is, question. the question is the DBS checks that we, we're doing are they being centralised or are they being sent out to another company? Um, Chair, I, I, I will be talking about DBSs, yeah. but we, I can't we, pick we're that up We're now. coming up to DBS. It's in a minute, David. We're just okay, going well, to, at the, at the minute, we just want to take the um, the, the comments on, on the zones. Yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Chair. Okay, um, I'll go to uh, Brian Heatley. Brian has his hand up about um, uh, the zoning. Brian. Yes, coming back to the zoning. Um, yes. I, I, I take everything you're saying, John, about the fact that the survey about unmet demand has been done and uh, shows that there, there isn't any. But I noticed that um, amongst the consultation replies, there seem to be 15 replies from Weymouth Hackney drivers. Uh, and one of the things they say is that they disagree that there is no evidence of unmet demand. Have I got that right? Uh, how many Hackney drivers are there altogether in Weymouth? Um, is, is there perhaps a bit more controversy behind this than, than may be apparent um, uh, from you know the, the survey? I, I, happy to answer that, Jay. I, I, I believe we have about 80 Hackney right. carriage proprietors in Weymouth. Um, and every three years we do, we commission an unmet demand survey um, and they, they do quite a comprehensive job of uh, looking at all of the ranks, the number of vehicles, discussing with various different focus groups, members of the public, um, students, etc., about any difficulties um, in obtaining uh, hackney carriages um the, the 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 survey which came back this time round said there was there was no un, unmet demand other than with uh, wheelchair accessible vehicles um and we've we have tried to address that now that's not to say that um this is a, a permanent situation the proposal is that we review this again in three years time the it is quite old school to 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 limit the number of hackney carriages many councils have deregulated it is something that we will duly consider in three years time uh, at the moment because of the timings of the unmet demand and because of the potential impact on proprietors and their and their plate values their vehicle values um, we thought it prudent to give some notice um, so the aspiration is potentially to remove that uh, limit in three years time and um, should anyone wish to um, uh, dispose of their Hackney vehicle uh, license and um, plate uh, during that time, then they would not be unduly affected by the loss in value. So we're kind of giving a bit of pre-warning that we may look at this in three years time. It's, it's sort of a, 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 a happy medium. But but I, I I think I entirely agree with you. But but the fifteen, there there is there's an element of uh, a, a minority of of those Hackney drivers who maybe would like a bit more competition. I, I'm not saying that I agree with that. I'm just trying to understand what their what their point of view is. Yeah, I um, I think. Chair, if it, if I if it's possible, could I just bring in Aileen? Just yeah, at absolutely, the moment? yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, is that do. all right? Just yeah. Aileen, would you would you mind just um, jumping in on this one because I, I I think there might be a bit of confusion as to that response, yeah. but um, would would appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my understanding of the response was that the Weymouth drivers were actually in favour of retaining the zones yeah. um, in Weymouth in particular. Um, but they did appreciate that the um, um, there was an unmet demand for the dis, um, what we call the WAVs, the, the wheelchair accessible vehicles, um, but they weren't too keen on the idea of the um, exemption for the electric vehicles. That's my understanding of the response. Yes. And that and that and that chair, if I may, that I think that aligns with my understanding as well, that um, that actually it would be quite strange for um, Hackney um, 
proprietors to um, wish for deregulation because that has an impact on the, on the value of their vehicle. Um, it's potentially that actually they were more aggrieved that there is um, going to be a, a limited allowance for fully electric vehicles to potentially become baited in Weymouth. That's not a free for all by any stretch of the imagination. It will be strictly controlled, but um, the licensing team will um, assess applications for fully electric vehicles for hackney plates under this policy. So that's probably where that um, where that misunderstanding comes from. OK, I I mean uh, this I, I raised the point. point because on page 63 it said uh, Weymouth hackney drivers disagree. There is no evidence of unmet demand um, and th this was attributed to 15 of them. So. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not too bothered about this. It is, is uh, it is possible there is some disagreement amongst them, but uh, and I am not for a moment suggesting that we should change the policy from what's put forward here. OK, okay. So, thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I think <laughs> I think we would be we would be living in we're living in a, a dreamland if we thought that all, all of our all of our trade uh, yeah. would ever be in in complete agreement about yeah. this because it is yeah. a contentious issue. Yeah. We what we've what we've tried to do is is, is um, not upset the apple cart too much at this point, but just to try and try and protect the trade within Weymouth um, whilst trying to dezone the council area so we're, it's, we're sort of doing it in two stages really. Yeah. OK, thank okay. you. Do you have any f further questions, Councillor Heatley? Uh, not on that point, no. OK, thank you. Um, I've just got one comment in the chat bar and that's from um, Councillor Kate Weller um, who states that um, I am happy with the unmet demand findings and everything else. Um, not too good to speak at the moment. I believe Councillor Weller is, is unwell at the moment. Um, Councillor Andrews. That's fine. John's answered my my question that or my reply that I was going to give to Brian, so that's fine. No problem at all. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, just just going back um, to the zones. Um, my uh, obviously uh, preferred option of the zones would be to retain the zones at the moment due to the fact that the unmet demand survey had been undertaken and then obviously have that conversation again in in uh, in three years time um, as to how things have evolved um, around then. But that, yeah, that's uh, I, I have no issue with 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 that um, that particular point in the policy. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, so just to clarify, um, the committee um, are happy to move forward with the proposals within the policy without amendment. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I believe so. I mean, I, I'm I'm in agreement with that. I believe uh, Councillor Andrews in agreement, unless I get anybody that raised their hands now to say that they have any big issue with that. I think it's a, a very fair way of doing it. Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so t t moving moving on then to the next section, t types of licence. So. Um, Chair, I've put an option here um, within the report just to just to enable um, a, an, an application for a, either um, a hackney carriage driver's license or a private hire driver's license. Our aspirations are to have a combined license. It just make, makes life easier for license holders and for yeah. ourselves. Um, however, we do recognise that there may be limited number of occasions where someone doesn't want a combined license. So um, our proposal is, Chair, with, with your um, consent is that we um, we add in uh, an ability to to make an application for either license. I haven't put that in the policy at this point. There are a couple of changes which are more for discussion um, that haven't actually been added in, and this is one of them. Um, I, 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 if the committee are minded to agree that. Yes, yeah, it make, makes again something else that, that that makes perfect sense. Either you can have your individuals or you can have your combined. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Chair. And I will move on to the next one. I've got two documents up here, which is why I'm a bit slow, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me just move on down. So the next section that um, we looked at is decisions. Now, th there was a response which came from um, 
from the trade in relation to the uh, Institute of Licensing safe and suitable uh, uh, and that it was it was just guidance. But it, it, it is just guidance, but it's what the statutory standards are based on. Um, it, it, it is a, a good document, a, a very useful document for us. Um, it, it, it's long overdue. I think we wish we, we had it 20 years ago. Um, it, we, we're recommending that we do rely on those uh, uh, that IOL safe and suitable and that um, also that it's uh, that it's brought in as soon as possible. Hence the recommendation that it comes in on the 1st of December. Um, we do, you know, we do appreciate the comments which have come in from from uh, respondents, but our overriding ambition is to protect the traveling public and this is a key element of that and we and we will be relying on it it, it, it is guidance but we will rely on it um, yeah yeah it, it is a it is a very yeah it's a very good document and like i said it's it's very useful to you it's very useful to me as a as a, as a counselor as well so yeah I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that in there brilliant thank you chair um so the next section which uh received quite a a number of responses was in relation to the tariffs. Now, now we, we've done this policy in two stages. Um, we haven't looked at the maximum tariffs. They're, 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 there's quite a disparity between them at the moment, between the predecessor council areas, and some of them haven't been reviewed for quite a long time. I think I think one's coming up for nine years since it's been reviewed. So, so we will look at that. There will be a complete separate consultation with the trade over that. Um, everyone involved will get an opportunity to, to ha have a say in that. We have to advertise it in the paper as well. And we'll certainly be sending out consultation documents and emails, etc. So um, what happens in, in short is, is we set the maximum tariff and the trade are free to operate within that. So we don't set a, a standard rate. Um, we just uh, deal with anybody that charges more than the maximum tariff through through uh, potentially uh, test purchase or a complaints process, etc. So we will we will be undertaking that after this uh, policy hopefully is agreed and we'll certainly have that in place before 1st, 1st of April. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thanks for that, um, John, again, for clarifying that as well about the uh, the, the, the setting of the uh, maximum uh, rate, because obviously I think there's some confusion around there of, uh, of, of, of the charges around there. So it's good just to clarify that. So thank you for that. No problem. And we'll obviously, now that the decision's been made about the zones, that will have a bearing on, on the tariff as well so that will all be taken into consideration it, i think it's quite important that we that we look after uh, um, operators that um, are dealing with urban areas it, it, the same as we would with those that um, that are where provision is demand is is different so we'll we'll take all of that into consideration um so the next the next section which um received quite a few responses was in relation to uh, uh, vehicles identification. Um, now the pro proposals are that we have um, pre-booked only signs on the on the rear doors of um, private hire vehicles and that and that's just really more than anything to educate members of the public that, that they can't flag down a private hire vehicle and, and, and those vehicles aren't allowed to apply for hire so they must be pre-booked only. The, the, the waters are muddied a little because of um, technology um, and the ability to uh, instantly book a, a taxi. So it, it, it does it does um, create some issues with um, with um, apps such as Uber, etc. So this is an attempt to try and deal with that to try and make it quite clear that Hackney carriages are the only taxis that are allowed to apply for hire. Now. We do appreciate the comments that have been received. It, it may well be that um, a vehicle, um, it's inappropriate for that vehicle to have pre-booked only plastered on the doors. So, um, you know, and that, that might be for a, a wedding vehicle or, you know, a, a, a other types that um, wouldn't want those stickers on. So there's a couple of options here. One is to allow magnetic plates, which can be re removed when somebody's using a vehicle for private private use or, or also to apply for an exemption. So we'll, we'll give a couple of options within um, 
that policy. So that if, if the committee are minded to agree, then we will look to amend um, the policy at 2.28 to allow that. Happy to take any sort of comments or discussion points about that. Yeah, I think it makes again something else that makes perfect sense. Do we have to have any comments on that? Sure, can I just come in uh, again? Yeah. Being an ex member of the trade, yeah. um, uh, I think that's a very good idea, especially with the, me the magnetic plates. Yeah. Uh, as people don't necessarily want that if they're uh, hiring cars to go to weddings, like John said, um, uh, etc. So, well, no problem with that at all. I think it's very good that you validated. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the next section was advertising. Now there was a comment which came in from um, Place and Resources overview in relation to um, the council's policy on advertising. So what we did is we went away and we had a we had a look at that. Um, the, the difficulty we have is that relies it, it, it applies to um, private companies who wish to advertise on council vehicles um, and, and other council um, owned and operated advertising opportunities uh, such as roundabouts etc. Um, it, it's not really readily transferable to, to the taxi policy. We, I'm not saying it's not it's not relevant, it doesn't have some good you know some good points in there. Um, Chair you, you'll be aware of my thoughts around promotion of gambling already. However, having, after discussing um, lifting any of uh, that council policy on advertising into the taxi policy advertising section, it, it, we, we decided it, it wouldn't be appropriate. Um, now that is to say that isn't to say that we, we don't have safeguards because anybody that wants to put an advert on the side of a taxi in Dorset will have to abide by the British Code of Advertising Practice and any breaches of that will result in, in withdrawal of permission for that advertising. Uh, our proposal at the moment, Chair, is, is not to amend the section on advertising at this current time, but to keep, uh, keep the uh, proposal or the recommendation from place and resources uh, in the back pocket should we um, get problems. So if we start to see a proliferation of uh, advertising which um, p p potentially promotes social harms, then we, we would bring this, bring us as additional proposal back to this committee to tighten up the advertising code. Um, I, I hope that's a, an appropriate way to address this chair um, and, and happy to put it out to the committee for discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy providing, you know, that there are, it does cover quite um, strongly, you know, regarding around it, what I would just class as any inappropriate advertising, which which would be along the lines of, you know, um, gambling, certain shops being advertised um, or, or, you know, anything like that. As long as that there's a there's a good coverage of that in there, then um, then I'm, I'm happy with that. I do have a. Um, uh, do you have a right to speak from uh, Councillor Jones? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it was me actually that brought this up under place and resources and looking at um, the, the advertising section, which is page 176, Appendix F. It's actually saying that we shouldn't promote gambling. But however, I think any advertisement on gambling must be seen as some form of promotion. So it, it's a little bit loose, to be honest, I, I think. I, I mean, personally, I don't want to see any gambling um, advertisement on, on any taxi at all. But I, I understand where John's coming from, but I, I just it, it's not particularly clear because it says we shouldn't promote. But I would have thought any advertisement was actually promoting gambling. Can you come back on that, John? Yes, of course. 
Chair, I'm, I, I, I'm more than happy to include the British Code of Advertising Practice within the conditions for advertising on, on our taxi trade. I think it, it, it would be unduly onerous to place the Council's advertising guidelines within the taxi policy. I think we could get challenged. I think it, we could be accused of exercising a, a, a moral compass within the taxi trade of um, of potentially stifling uh, income opportunities for uh, proprietors uh, unduly uh, over and above um, what is the expected norm. Um, the, the, the advertising guidelines which the council has drawn up uh, quite rightly applies to council property and we have every right to uh, dictate what is acceptable to us. Um, Taxis aren't our property. We don't have the right to dictate what should be on the side of a taxi. Um, I, I have to park my my own feelings relating to to um, uh, social deprivation uh, and um, the normalisation of gambling um, and all other a lot of other social harms, because what we have to do is we have to act within our abilities as a licensing authority. So at this point, the proposal is that we don't enforce the council's additional guidelines within our taxi policy. Um, however, we do keep it under review. And if we do get any advertising which is questionable or complaints from either members, traveling public or applications from the trade, for adverts which we um, which we think might be unsuitable, then the proposal is to bring those to committee. And if the committee wish to have a mind to um, Dorset Council's advertising guidelines, then that's you know that that's we wouldn't fetter the discretion of the committee in that respect. So that's that that would be our proposal: is that we don't amend the policy, um, we, and we don't lift anything from the council's advertising code into the policy at this time. However, we do keep it under review if, if it proves to be a problem. Hmm. I, 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 oh, I can see where you're coming from. I just feel a little bit uneasy that actually what we're doing is to say, look, you can accept adverts from um, gambling uh, corporations, uh, shops, call them what you like. Um, Chair, what, what is your feeling on this? My, <laughs> my, my feeling on this is that I, I, I personally wouldn't want to see any gambling advertised on any vehicle. That, that, Can that. we then move an amendment to actually incorporate some wording specifically around gambling to say the council will not accept are we allowed to do that at this stage? Because yeah. if we are, I'm happy to propose that amendment. Okay. Yeah, because I have a, I also, I do have a um, comment here from uh, Councillor Weller as well that says I agree with Councillor Jones. Um, uh, so any stronger wording would be welcome to me. I think a concern that I have is if. Uh, they're free to put advertising on their vehicles. How long is it going to be before it's flagged up to us as to what they've got advertised on it? Some people might not take offence to certain advertisements on vehicles, but other people might take offence. And it's just what areas would those vehicles be in and how long is it going to be before it's flagged up? And could we potentially then be in a situation where, you know, if it was to come to committee, they could say, well, I've been driving around with it for a year and nobody's complained about it. Yeah. Um, I do I do have um, I do have a, a right to speak from um, Graham Duggan. Yeah, that'll be you. Hello. Hello, Chair, hello committee. Uh, and, and thanks for John for taking us through the report in, in, a, in a detailed manner. It's really good listening. Um, it's a really interesting point, isn't it? Um, I think I'd want to just I just caution committee to uh, to have any advice, to listen to any advice from uh, from legal on this in from, from from Lara, because yeah. 
um, we, we, uh, we would be in a difficult position if we included something in the policy uh, which didn't have uh, a strong uh, legal footing. Oh, yeah. um, so now, it might be that we don't have a legal answer for you today, and it may be that we need to come back to yourself, uh, self chair, on this. Um, but the committee could, uh, and I'll, I'll bow to John's better knowledge, but committee could express something along the lines of we would strongly discourage uh, any advertising uh, of, 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 of something like gambling um, uh, as, as, uh, as a note in the policy. And, and I think that would probably be, be, be acceptable. Um, but again, I'll, I'll bow to John's better knowledge and also that of Lara from uh, from a legal perspective, if, if that's relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Graham. Um, I've also got a comment from Councillor David Taylor that says I totally agree with Carol and I've got one more right to speak. So I'll go to I've got right to speak from Councillor John Andrews, then I'll come to um, John Newcomb and then we'll get we'll ask Lara. Yeah, I was just going to, Graham's take words out of my mouth. I was going to say, Leon, our legal need to be involved with this because, um, yes. you know, we don't want to get ourselves in all sorts of trouble because we, we've said something that we shouldn't have said. And uh, and we won't want to refer to uh, the the council's policy if it if it comes to that. But I, legal is, is the way to go. So I think we need to leave the policy like it is at the moment and then uh, look at the legal option and change it if we need to in the future. Um, Should we ask? Do you, yeah. do, you want, do you want to know if Lara has a has a view on it now? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Chair. It's Lara here. Hi, Lara. Um, gambling is lawful to advertise, but um, I think Graham has expressed what I was going to say. I was going to say you could say something like the council wouldn't encourage gambling advertising, but perhaps Graham's wording it is perhaps better than what I was going to suggest. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lara. Um, John, your thoughts? Well, so I, 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 it's, it's brilliant to have this debate, it's, and I, I really do, I do appreciate the committee's input. So, a sort of a, 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 a working solution could be. So, if, if I look, I'm, I've got page 176 up of the of the agenda pack. And th this is the, the council's um, guidance on sponsorship um, and advertising. Um, so obviously we've already got the advertising standards agent advertising code at the top here. So I'm looking at section D. Um, so we've all, we already have that. Um, th this next one doesn't apply. So the code of recommended practice on local authority publicity, that doesn't apply because it's not local authority publicity. We shouldn't get involved in anything that's socially or politically contentious or conflicts with the policies values of the council because it, it's not council property. Um, however, it, the rest I believe is potentially up for debate. So um, unlawful prejudice or discrimination, absolutely. I'd be fully on board with including that. Uh, I, I don't think the next one, legal or financial conflict with the interests of the council, we shouldn't include that. Conflicts with the council's branding, also again, we shouldn't include that. Party political associations, lo lobbying campaigns, no. Um, but, but the rest potentially, yes. So anything that promotes Smoking, the irresponsible consumption of alcohol, gambling, except lotteries or pornography and adult content. Potentially, we could add in a, a, an additional note, as Graham has suggested, um, the, the licensing authority strongly to cut discourage, and I, I can list those that we've just gone through, and I can add that in. I'm, I'm, quite, I'm more than happy to do yeah. that. I don't think I don't think that that would be challengeable. Yeah. OK, and um, as it, um, yeah, I, I'm 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 happy with that. I just want to go back to, to Carol to say if, if uh, uh, Councillor Jones, um, are you happy with that to be? To be if that's in? the yeah. very best we can get, then I would say yes. But I still think that it doesn't actually say they can't. So in which case people still can and they're not breaching our rules. But if if we can only get legal to accept that discourage is the strongest term, then I yeah. guess we have to go with that. But I would prefer to see will not allow at all, basically. Yeah. Uh, uh, how about how about uh, an additional safeguard that any applications for advertising which are not in line with these guidelines will be referred to the committee for a decision? Then Perfect. that that, that, that puts the power. 
back into your hands. Yep. Okay. I'm very happy with that, John. Good man. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Thank you for that, Councillor Jones. I appreciate your comments there because, yeah, it was, uh, yes. Um, uh, Councillor Taylor, did you have a, a, a question? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, John. Uh, you know how passionate I am about anti-gambling and everything else we've discussed in the past. I tend to think, or are we liable as duty of care for the council or safeguarding, we should be protecting our public. And that's where I look at gambling and all the other things we're discussing there as harm to our public. So does that come into the law? It, 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 it's it's not for us to enforce those um, those laws. Um, we're not the proper authority. Um, we don't have the the power under relevant legislation. However, with the the agreement that we issue guidelines and strongly discourage wording and referrals to committee does in effect give us the ability to to yeah. make sure that we don't allow anything that it could potentially cause harm. Yeah, thank you. It's just a passion and that Carol is the same and chair and it's vice chair. It is a it's a blight on our community, basically. But thank you very much for taking my question. Yeah, thank you. No so you're, you're, thank all, you, uh, we're all content with that one, I think, which is good. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. I've just um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm ping, pinging all over the place and um, <laughs> trying to find my way back to where where I came from. Um, OK, that doesn't help. I, I should have got somebody to. Oh, look, brilliant. By some <laughs> small miracle, I've landed where I should be. Um, God. So uh, codes. So this this um, section received a few responses, but um, but no, nothing, nothing that required any amendment to the policy. The same with complaint handling. We um, we had um, we had a couple of responses. Um, but we, we will deal with that because we have a complaints process behind the, the scenes and, and you know we're, we're constantly fine tuning that to make sure that works. I think one, one of the key parts of our complaints um, handling is that, that we allow multiple methods to come into us, certainly for people that have got disabilities and communication issues. So, you know, whether that be by text, by um, phone, by email, uh, by any, you know, any other method. So we, we reviewing that, making sure that um, we make it, we, we, we don't create any unnecessary barriers to people being able to make complaints about, um, you know, where things haven't gone quite right. Um, the inspections so we we i think there was we, we perhaps didn't make it quite clear within the consultation document that went out we, we our ambitions are to enable as many inspection centers as possible so we're, we're opening it up um to any authorized mot station within the council area can apply to do our vehicle inspections for us according to our code. Now we'll be talking to all of those garages, we'll be discussing how much it costs, um, you know, making it a, a happy medium between uh, the garage costs and the cost to the vehicle owner, proprietor. We don't make any money out of that. It's not it's not a money making exercise. We, it's you, you pay pay the garage direct. They inspect the vehicle and we get the form. So it's not you know, it's not a cost making exercise. Um, and that and that kind of comes through on the next comments as well relating to um, relating to um, the national standards. So we we will we are adopting the national standards for vehicles. They will go on to our inspection forces there. Um, we're hoping to increase the number of garages. So um, hopefully those comments have been dealt with. Um, sharing information. I think I've covered that at 2.42. I do have a uh, right to speak from uh, Councillor Andrews. Yes, of course. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. Uh, that, this, this is the only one I had a bit of a, a pushback from the trade on, uh, but I totally understand why uh, you're, you're, we're going for six monthly inspections and uh, I totally endorse the, uh, the the problem had up in the north of the county up here. Um, they had to go all the way to Rampersham for a vehicle check in the past. Uh, that takes uh, an extraordinary amount of time as it's right through the country lanes from Sherbourne um, and um, 
and it takes a taxi off the road for quite a, quite a time and it was quite a cost. Um, I have to say, um, there, is, is there a combine? Is there a way that the uh, the taxi companies can combine? Because they have to have an MOT as well. I know they technically don't have to have an MOT because a taxi test is up and beyond the MOT, but it doesn't get registered by the DVLA. Consequently, if you don't have a taxi, then you need to carry your inspection certificate with you because you're going to get stopped by the police every time you go past an ANPR camera. So there's something that needs to be done uh, technically with the DVLA to to sort that out if we can. Sorry, that's my phone going off. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, so um, yeah, it's um, it's it, it's it's a good way of doing stuff is to make the make the local MOT garages do the taxi <laughs> test. But there are a couple of minor minor difficulties there because of the uh, checking the meters for the hackney cabs, uh, and and they have to check for fire extinguishers, first aid kits. God knows what they have to have first aid kits because I don't know any taxi driver that would administer first aid because um, uh, they're all frightened to these days. Um, I probably would, but um, uh, but um, um, so I'm just wondering if there's a, a, a way that they can combine the MOT with the with the taxi test um, to make it a little bit cheaper for the operators because they've got to have it anyway. Um, and um, I totally agree because my favourite taxi, I did 92,000 miles one year in my favourite car because I had a couple. And uh, 92,000 miles is a lot and only one taxi test that was due. So, uh, yeah. So, totally agree with with, with what you've done on, on vehicle inspections. Just thought I'd make that play. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to pick that up, Chair. Yeah. Um, yes, so we, we, we will uh, open up a dialogue with all of our existing approved garages. Um, we've got a bit of a mix match uh, across the Dorset Council area inherited from the uh, previous arrangements. But um, th th that will be a part of the conversation. You know, if, uh, if a vehicle owner, proprietor brings their car in for an MOT, can they pay just a, a small additional fee to, for the extra over and above inspection? I, I don't see why we can't discuss that with the MOT centres. That would, that would be fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the aim, and, and as I said briefly before, the aim is to have as many of these as possible so you don't have to drive long distances and take a whole day out of, of work to get your car checked. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I don't think I've skipped over anything. I did briefly mention that we will um, allow vehicles, uh, uh, so the inspections will only apply to vehicles 12 months or over that that has gone in at page 113 on the revised policy um sharing information i think i've yeah that's um so that that that's been amended slightly i feel i've got a feeling of deja vu <laughs> i think yeah i think we discussed <laughs> inspections earlier on with regards to uh vehicles of uh, of, of being a year old yes and then yes. we've, well, yeah, we've, 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 we've bounced Apologies. back. <laughs> um, we, okay. we haven't, we haven't talked about CCTV, have we? So I think, um, <laughs> let, me just, let me just get myself down here. I should have put the section numbers on here. That would have made a lot more sense. Apologies. So 11 to 14, appendix A, section 2. Okay. So, um, so CCTV. So we 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 haven't amended the policy, which is probably why I can't find it. So we haven't amended the policy in relation to CCTV, um, and the reason for that is we we just don't feel it's appropriate to impose a, a condition requiring um, taxis to have CCTV. It, it's a voluntary basis. What we do say is that where CCTV is fitted, it must comply with the uh, with the code, which is issued by the Camera Surveillance Commissioner through the uh, Information Commissioner's Office. Um, and, and we're not proposing any amendments in that respect, but that does relate to a, to a, a point which was uh, received from the Place and Resources Overview. Um, I, I'm happy to have a discussion about that. Um, uh, you know, uh, officers' views, not necessarily, as we've already discovered, not necessarily committees' views, which is which is fine. That's uh, that's why we have these discussions. Yeah, I know. I'm 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 happy with uh, with with what you've got uh, in the policy. Um, and that's, has anybody else got any questions around the CCTV in vehicles? 
No, it's something that, you know, it, it, it's good to encourage to have them because like we said in the in the past it, it's you know the, the footage has been very very useful should you have any concerns that come in about a driver or anything that you know the the footage potentially can't lie um i do have a uh right to speak from councillor heatley thank you chair I, i'm just looking at the wording on page 97 that came from place and resources overview committee uh, there was a request for further work to be undertaken in respect of the requirement for and the use of dash cameras in taxis this could be considered by the licensing committee um so uh, <laughs> while the whole thing is addressed to us i, I think it's important we do pause a little bit on it because uh, it looks as though it's a rather specific request there that they want us to think about having a requirement that said um and I, I when i first saw it i reflected on the fact that um uh, i spent a happy day doing six taxi licensing things about a month ago two of them were complaints and in both of those cases we advised the person that they might not be in the position they were in if they'd had some dash cams so that made me keen but I'm very struck by the point in the paper that says we have very low numbers of complaints anyway and if that's really right it seems to me that a requirement for dash pams is just over the top can I, can I, yeah can yeah, I just yeah, come so in there Jack? Got any thoughts? yeah I, I mean I know a fleet of taxis in in my town have all got dash cams fitted now you're talking over 250 pound a vehicle to have them done properly rear and front dash cams and i think in 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 this current climate and asking them to do ask forcing the taxis to do that is, is a bit off track uh, when as as councillor heatley has just said we get very very low uh, uh complaints even though some of them what we do do uh, as you, as we we were in the committee together mr heatley and i on that that day and um we did advise people to have dash cams because it, it wouldn't have been a complaint wouldn't have even come to the committee had they had dash cams so um yeah, yeah I, I i think you're absolutely right john and what we've got in the policy i don't think we need to enforce dash cams on people just advise people that it would yeah. be yeah. sensible I've, I've, to have them if you can afford them Go look at that. Yeah. yeah i believe i was on that same committee as well um and <laughs> yeah and and yeah I, I i agree i think it should be more of a of a, of a recommendation um, than, than to enforce it, because like I said, it, it, it can get quite expensive. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Chair. Any other comments on that? No? No, don't think we have. Lovely, thank you. I, I shall move on. Criminal convictions and rehabilitation. So um, th there was a, a, a couple of comments received in relation to um, the disclosure arrangements um, and this this covers this section in the report and also the next one dbs checks um all, all of the predecessor councils uh, as is standard practice across licensing authorities for taxi licensing uh, um, uh, require enhanced disclosures uh, rehabilitation of offenders act um, doesn't apply for taxi licenses um, we, we're not proposing to change anything that we don't already do. Um, it, it, in addition, we already require basic disclosures for operators, for those taking bookings, for for very obvious reasons that um, people's properties and uh, personal details and uh, potential safeguarding issues uh, 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 could be at risk if there was a criminal element in, inside those operator um, control rooms so we're not proposing to do anything different um, uh, than, than what we already do and what is established um, practice now in relation to the dbs checks so we, we do appreciate that it is a, a sticking point that you can't get an enhanced disclosure for one department in the council and utilize it for another department that is an issue with dbs disclosures that's not the council being awkward um unfortunately they're not they're not transferable it, it, it is it is odd we have you know raised that before with dbs as have many other local authorities but unfortunately they're, they're the rules and until they're changed we have to abide by them what we have done though is that we we need to look after the traveling public we need to make sure that our um, license holders are regularly 
DBS checks and we're proposing that that happens every six months. Now there's obviously a cost implication to that. They're around £40 a go, so £40 every six months adds up over, over three years term of the licence. Um, so what we've proposed is that, um, that licence holders are, are more than welcome to sign up to the DBS update service, which is a lot cheaper. Um, so you apply for your DBS, your, your enhanced disclosure through us, and this picks up on the point which came through here. So, so we 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 are the um, DBS applicant, and the driver applies through us. So all the information comes through us um, in order to, to issue the licence as an approved body. Um, and then once that first enhanced disclosure um, has been issued, then the, the license holder is free to apply to the update service. I think it's within 30 days and it, it, it's about a pound a month. So it's a lot cheaper. And it's potentially savings of around 170, 180 pounds um, uh, over the terms of the license, which which is obviously going to be beneficial to the driver. So, so we're, we're making sure we look after people, keep them safe, but also trying not to add additional cost burden onto drivers. So ho hopefully committees in agreement with that as a as a way forward. Yeah. Thank Again, you, another bit of the policy that, that, that makes perfect sense and it's something that's uh, that's needed um, and you know is is um, a good a really good bit of the policy. I do have a right to speak from Councillor Taylor. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, John. I'm very pleased about this because I was concerned the DBS was not being uh, controlled properly because, uh, as you know, many of us go through DBS enhancements on top. Do we do that as well with taxi drivers? All, all, all drivers have to do an enhanced DBS. Yes, it's not just Fantastic. a basic. So o operators are a basic level um, which takes into consideration the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act um, and drivers have to do an enhanced level which includes anything historical that might be relevant but also notes from police forces etc. So that, that all comes in to us via the, that, via the applicant. That is absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, it's um, like I said, DBSs are, are, are um, you know, are a must. We, we, they have to have them. And again, you know, when we look at safeguarding around um, our, you know, the, the, the travelling public and the customers that the taxi drivers take, we do have to ensure that obviously the, the public are being looked after by the driver. So they are essential and something that I, you know, definitely, definitely agree on that bit. And, and uh, yeah, definitely needs to be in there. Um, don't know. I have no other comments. Does anybody else have any comments about the DBS? No. Good bit of work. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think just just whilst we're on that subject, there was a comment received about uh, us being reliant on uh, Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Service to, to send through. <laughs> we, 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 we've got first hand experience of that not working. So we, yeah, you know, yeah, that, 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 this that, is a much safer. That, much that's safer definitely approach. something I am not in favour of. So, so yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, happy with that recommendation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. the next. So the next section in um, uh, uh, the responses table was uh, about approved garages. We, we've covered that. We're seeking to appoint as many as possible, and then we and then we move on to drivers. So medical examinations. So there are some pressures, without a doubt, at the moment through COVID and GP practices being, you know, unable to to operate at um, optimum efficiency, uh, lack of ability to get um, appointments, um, medicals, etc. So. We, we we do appreciate that there are problems at the moment. Ordinarily, we don't normally see those levels of delays. Um, however, we, we we align our medical examinations with our three year cycle for licenses. So when you apply, you submit your medical, um, your group two, and then three years later, you do it again. Um, and then there's additional uh, requirements when you reach certain ages. So so that, that, that that's more or less standard practice and that we're not proposing to change the policy in relation to that. What what we will, however, do is be flexible with where those medicals come from um, in as much as uh, as far as possible within um, what's allowable. Um, and there are a number of options which we're investigating, which we're looking at in relation to um, where 
drivers go to if they can't get a medical from their GP. So we are we are working on that and we do hear we do we do know there are problems. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, sharing information, we've done that. We've covered that already. Um, there was a comment here about um, limiting taxi drivers to anyone over age 21. We, we, we can't do that. Um, the legislation says that you have to have held a license for at least 12 months, at, you know, and at, at, that's the rules. We're not we're not seeking to change that. Operators can't get insurance, John, anyway. No, okay. that's good <laughs> <Yeah>. to know. <laughs> Thanks. A Cu couple more tweaks here on page 117, just in relation to safeguarding wording. Medicals I've, I've covered. Um, cost of a license, I don't think we had any comments here, so I think we're down to vehicles. These are drivers, so let me just scoot down a little, little bit. There we are. So, so the next section where we've had um, some comments in, in relation to vehicles, um, it, it would appear, as you are aware, Chair, I'm, I'm fairly new to Dorset. It would appear that we have we have had some some strange goings on in relation to uh, transfer of vehicle plates in the past, historical, not not recent. Um, we, we follow the rules at Dorset and the rules are that you can't transfer a vehicle plate. You know, um, we think there might have been a, a, a couple of mistakes made um, in predecessor councils in relation to this, but that, they, that, that certainly has been tightened up now. That's that's not an ongoing issue. Um, and there, there may also be a bit of misunderstanding in, in the responses in relation to the ability to transfer licenses between vehicles because, because you can't. You can put a temporary vehicle on if your vehicle's um, damaged, being repaired, and you can, you, you know, you can sell a vehicle with a plate. So that's absolutely fine. But you know, otherwise, the legislation doesn't allow you to transfer. So no amendments to the rules in that respect. Um, the second part of that paragraph relates to to our regulations, our guidelines covering the size of seats. Now, Chair, you'll be aware that some vehicles are, are bigger than others and some vehicles have, have um, quite small seats in the back um, for passengers and, and may be licensed for um, a, a higher number of, dry, of passengers than than um, than would seem prudent. Now, we appreciate that um, owners of those vehicles have bought those in good faith based on um, the information available at the time and have licensed them and have a legitimate expectation that they will continue to be licensed. So we're not proposing to ban those vehicles that with seats that don't comply with um, section 4.4, which is page 123 of the agenda. And um, what, what, what we're proposing, Chair, is just to slightly tweak that, that any, any new applications will have to comply, but those that are already licensed, those with existing licenses, um, will be continued to be licensed until the end of the life of that vehicle. Yeah. Um, um, and, and hopefully that's acceptable to the committee, but happy happy to take any discussion points on that. I'm I'm happy with that. Any comments on that one? I'm very happy with that, Chair. Um, it, it just comes about, you know, uh, particularly um, Vauxhall, Severas and vehicles yeah. like that. You can't get a, a small child in those back seats, let alone an adult. So they, they can't be, uh, you know, they shouldn't be uh, licensed for six people. They should only be licensed for four people, the same as yeah. every, every other vehicle. Yeah, agree. Thank you, Chair. Oh, I've got a right to speak from uh, Councillor Jones. Sorry, just a quick, it's just a okay. thought. It's just a thought, really. Um, is there any obligation on behalf of the driver to put in a child seat if they're transporting a child um, under a certain age at all? We, we, well, I'm just coming up to that, if that's all right. Oh, <laughs> if you, if you, hold, if, if you hold that thought, I'll be with you. I'll be with you shortly. The um, yes, so we've um, we've 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 just amended so if I, i'll get to that in a second so just just to say 4.7 uh, apologies it, it, this shouldn't have been in here so um, we've taken that out um it, mechanical inspections can be uh, undertaken by a, 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 an approved inspector it doesn't have to be dorset council mechanics um 
obviously Dorset Council does own a number of depots. They uh, they may well um, wish to offer uh, taxi vehicle inspections on our behalf, uh, and and they will be you know uh, in the pot uh, as it were with with all of the other MOT stations as well. Um, let me just scoot down. I don't think there's any more changes. Um, let me try and. So child seats is coming up in a little bit, I believe, within the within the codes. Um, let me just scoot down here. OK, so um, it, Appendix A, so our equality charter. So we, we're really grateful to um, the Disability Forum for their um, response, Dor Dorset Disability and Equality Forum. Um, they, 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 we have involved them in the drafting of this. They have been, they have been really instrumental in how we've pulled this equality charter together. Um, they sent us a comprehensive response. It wasn't in the original consultation report, um, and if I just explain briefly why that was, it, it, it came through uh, as a file which is on a on a shared drive. Um, and unfortunately, the consultation team weren't able to access that. Um, it took us a little bit of time to get a copy of it, but once we did, we we read it, we we reviewed it, and we amended the policy accordingly. So we've lifted quite a lot of it, um, quite a lot of um, the content straight out of the um, submission from the forum. Um, a few tweaks here and there, but more more or less verbatim, um, and and it really it really bumps up our equality charter and hopefully helps to eliminate those horrible times when you know when people are discriminated against it, it, it it's very rare it's got to be said that uh, uh, taxi trade generally by and large are, are incredibly helpful and go the extra mile um, however there there are odd occasions where where we see discrimination and we will we will deal with it and we will deal with it robustly um, and this equality charter will help that because it, it tells license holders and the public what, what to expect and, and what we will be expecting as a licensing authority. So I'll, I'll pause there if there are any comments about the equality charter because it, it has been it has been amended um, substantially. Does anybody have any comments? I think it's really good and really detailed and I'm really pleased to see it in the report. Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let me just scoot down. So yeah, so you've you've obviously worked out anything new is a uh, is in red. <laughs> Should have said that at the beginning, shouldn't I? Child seats, there we go. I knew it was coming eventually, I just didn't know quite when. So yeah, so we had some comments in relation to child seats in, in taxis. Um and what we thought was best was just simply to refer to the government guidance on it. So uh, when, when children can travel uh, with and without car seats in cars. And so we, we've just put a link to that within within the policy. So, it, it, you know, if it ever gets updated, then um, it remains current. Ho hopefully that uh, that answers uh, the question earlier on. Councillor Jones. Um, I think so. Um, so but is the driver legally obliged to have a child in a child seat or or not? Uh, can I double check with Aileen? Would that would that be OK, Chair? Thank yes. you. Aileen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no, there's there is an exemption under the legislation for taxis for for children travelling in taxis that they don't have to have um, be in a child seat. So the driver or the vehicle owner is not under any legal obligation to supply one. OK, that's legislated, then we can't do anything. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ailey. Thank you. Apologies, Chair. I think um, I, uh, seven years still in licensing, but it, but in London and um, I, I fortunately um, taxi licensing is not undertaken by local authorities in London. It's uh, undertaken by Transport for London. So I am a little bit rusty on some of this. So my my apologies if um, if I don't immediately know the answers to things. Um, okay. um, so the next change was in relation to receipts that are issued by um, drivers. We've taken that out. We, we agree with the comments received. We don't think it's appropriate for uh, the address 
requirement on the receipt um, we think that could lead to a lot more problems than it solves so we're content that um, as long as the passenger is, knows who who the driver the driver's name and the badge number that's absolutely yeah, yeah. Fine. again again going back to uh, sort of uh, safeguarding again it's it's just about as much as safeguarding the uh, the traveling public than it is to safeguard the drivers as well it is chair and i think that's probably a good point to um to, to, to pick up on, uh, there, there were there were quite a few comments that came in uh, about protecting drivers, and and we do mm. we do appreciate that it's a tough job, and you can get some yeah. really difficult yeah. customers, and so we we you know if it, <laughs> we we joked we joked before about uh, licensing passengers. <laughs> the um, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we're not in a position to be able to do that, but we do we we do try. Um, as much as possible um, to look after the trade within um, our abilities, but also we're, we're very we're very open minded when we get complaints. You know, yes. we, 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 there's always two sides to a story and we, we never jump straight on to something on face value. We always go and speak to the license holder before we, you know, we, before we take any action, mm -hmm. just, just just to make sure. So so ho ho hopefully we get that right. I'm not saying we yeah, always I, do, I, but I'd like to think anybody that's ever sort of co had to come across us with complaints like that would uh, would be uh, very happy with the way way that it's dealt with. Thank you, Chair. Um, so next, um, the next change I've got here is in relation to found property. So this came from Place and Resources again. It was just a, a, a and it was also included, I think, within the consultation response. So um, we, we've amended the policy slightly just to reflect a Dorset Police's policy on found property, aka lost property. Um, and we've put a link in to the Dorset Police website in relation to that. So it, it uh, we haven't lifted it verbatim because it, it may well change and it's also a little bit complicated. It's sort of values of money and items and which which needs to be handed in where, etc. So so we've just put a link to the police website in that respect. Hope, hopefully that's um, that's that's sufficient. All right, then I think you'll be glad to hear that I'm nearing the end. Of, um, of the process. Um, OK, so there's a, a link to the avatar. You, you, you'll notice, Chair, that a, a few sections within the policy is slightly duplicated. Now, there is good reason for that. It's not us going balmy. It's just that we different different matters apply to different areas. So some apply to drivers, some apply to vehicles, some apply to operators, which is why there's a little bit of duplication. We have tried to limit that and we've also tried not to contradict ourselves uh, where possible. Um, and obviously we will keep the policy under review. And if we have, you know, if, if there is something which isn't quite right, which they may, we may well be, then um, we will bring, bring it back to committee with for a revision. OK, um, so I, I, I'm at the end. Um, okay. There are there have been a few minor grammatical numbering um, errors that have been corrected. Um, the criminal conviction policy with your agreement is we'd like we'd like to bring that in from the 1st of First. December. Yeah. Um, a, a, apart from that, I think I think I'm more or less there. OK, um, I'll just go back to the committee, just see if anybody has any um, questions for, for you, John, or anything for clarification or whether they have anything for Aileen. Does anybody from the committee have anything? Um, if we're passing this on block chair, do we need to put in um, our words on the advertising situation? Um, we will i mean we, we've got some wording there haven't we i think we will go to um go back to john on his his thoughts for that or we might even need to go to lara with that one I, chair I, i'm happy to pick that up i think if if we we could deal with this uh, uh, like a licensing committee um whereas the minded to decision is to add in a paragraph yes. relating yes. to advertising standards uh, as i've outlined um uh, during the discussion that yeah um, that strongly discourage and refer to committee and then listing that 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 section um, okay. where appropriate from the from the council's policy um, and then it, more than happy for you to review that and um, and approve that okay yeah that's yeah. fine then in which case chair i'm very happy to uh move the recommendations as laid out with that addition yeah. 
Yes, Thank I think you. the only ones were obviously the extra we had in there was obviously with the uh, criminal conviction coming up in yeah. as of the 1st of December. Obviously, we, you know, we discussed that. There were some, um, other, obviously, the existing zones in Weymouth as well. That was another thing that we, that we agreed on with the recommendation that was in the policy. Um, and I think there was a bit around the, the pre-booked about magnets and putting some bits in there about their options. Um, to, of, of what they could do with regards to that and obviously then we did have the um the section on gambling and i think that was the only sections that we we made any addition to unless i'm missing something no, I, think you're, I think you're right chair yeah. yeah so if, if if you're happy um with with that and obviously the recommendations that we have in front of us if you're happy to take all of that on block happy to second it, well, if I can have a proposer first. Sorry. I'm happy to propose, Chair. Count. I'm very happy to second and an excellent report, by the way, John. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to go through the uh, roll call. Obviously, we are this is this is a, 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 a minded to we are making a minded to decision to um, Graham Duggan. Um, so I will start at the top. I've got Councillor John Andrews, but I'm not sure if John's dropped out of the meeting. I can't see him on there. No, he's not there. OK. So I will then go to uh, Councillor Derek Beer. Are you minded to approve or refuse or abstain? Do you have Councillor Beer? It looks like we've lost Councillor Beer as well. OK. Yeah, Oh, it's just it's only about 85 people standing. Right, I've got Councillor Dyer. Mind you to approve, Chair. Thank you very much. And I've got Councillor Brian Heatley. Uh, approve, please, Chair. Thank you. I've got Councillor Carol Jones. Approve. Thank you. Councillor David Taylor. Approved, Chair, and thank you. Thank you. you. Councillor Kate Weller. Approve. Thank you. I will just go back. We haven't got John Andrews, have we, Councillor John Andrews? No. And I believe that we also lost Derek Beer. Yeah, no, they're not there. No, OK, thank you. Um, I um, obviously also... Um, minded to approve as well so are you happy to take that um minded to graham uh thank you madam uh chairman yes after listening to the discussion today uh about the proposed taxi licensing policy and your committee's minded to recommend decision i can exercise uh, my delegated powers to approve the taxi licensing policy for adoption with the amendments agreed today for implementation on the dates contained in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I would just like to say as well, I want to say a huge thank you to the trade, to the public who um, took the time to respond to the consultation. We were very, very grateful for that. Also want to be say a big thank you to um, Aileen and John. I know this been, this has been a really, really big piece of uh, work and it's, it's, it's a brilliant policy and I just, I'm really grateful to, to the officers that I have on licensing because when you bring a policy to, to, to the committee, it's generally a policy that very, very rarely do we have any concerns with because they are very, very good policies. And I really, really do appreciate your, your times and efforts. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And I do want to say a big thank you to the Equality Group because that was a big piece of work in that. And I really, really do appreciate their comments as well. So thanks, guys. Did a great job, and I'm I'm um, I'm really happy with that. Um, I'm just looking through. Okay, I've just sorry. I'm just looking through some bits that I've got in my um, chat bar. Um, no, but I did hear. Also. Oh, Councillor Fry's just come in to say um, he is in the meeting now, um, but, but did not hear all the discussion. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, 
Councillor Fry would be in agreement that it was a, 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 a really good report and uh, I've got Councillor Weller that's put agreed. Agree with Emma, many thanks, great work and David Taylor's put excellent work. So again, I think you've you've got a big thank you there from uh, from my committee and I'd like to thank you all for your input. And uh, Thank you. So I will uh, now move on. Do we have any urgent items? No, there's no urgent items. Thanks, Elaine. Do we have any exempt business? No, we don't. No. OK, well, I will draw this meeting to a close. Uh, thank you all for joining me this morning and um, and thanks for some great work. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. Chair. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well done, Emma. Great.